It's time for us to check back in with Verna May and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. I could write a whole book in itself about all the ups and downs that happened to me and the boys trying to keep house by ourselves. Some funny, some sad, many well worth remembering. Once they were playing some kind of a game where Willie Vernon was a cowboy and his tricycle a horse. When Orban tried to lasso the horse, Willie Vernon, meaning to cut the rope, slashed Orban's face. There was no way I could get him to a doctor. The roads were blocked with snow, and there were no telephones, no men folks at any of the neighboring houses. So with only alcohol, adhesive tape, and prayers, I dressed the wound, which was deep. It cured up with only a very slight scar. Then there was the time when our pig got out of his pen about midnight. Me and the two older boys went to get it back up. He was determined to outdo us. While one was pushing him through the fence and the other two pulling, he suddenly decided he wanted inside and threw us all into a muddy, sloppy mess. In the middle of the night, we had to heat water for a bath and leave our clothes on the outside. The kids will never let me forget the time our cow got into the chicken house and I demanded she come out with your hands up, thinking it was someone still in our hands. I still keep the old door that we had to replace with a new one after someone kicked one of the panels out trying to break in. I sure was scared stiff that time. I had no gun and would not have wanted to use one if I had. When I said, please God, don't let me have to kill someone, he got the message and ran away. It was very embarrassing when I had to take my cow to a neighbor who owned a bull. The two older boys driving the cow, me carrying the baby and leading the next oldest, we went up the hill. I was saving having to explain why I had come. The neighbor attended to the animals while I went on with the children and visited his wife. When I was ready to return home, my friend said, you will have more trouble getting your cow to go home. Better leave the little children here and come back after them. This I was glad to do. Although it meant climbing the hill again, I can laugh about it all now, but it sure was not so funny then. When I had to go to the store, I took my kids and left them with my sister who lived up another holler, Short Fork. After making the two-mile trip to the store and carrying my groceries home, I returned to my sister's after my children. It took all day. I'm not complaining. I am only explaining. But I sure was glad when Creeps Reynolds opened a store and began delivering his groceries to his customers. One weekend, Willie did not come home. I was disappointed, but did not think anything wrong because he often had to work through the weekend. He got time and a half for this extra work, but he usually tried to send me word when he was not coming home. Monday evening when his boss, Red Gayhart, came by our house and asked why Willie had not met him to go to work that day, I really began to worry. Red told me Willie had started home Friday and Red had been told to pick him up Monday morning. It really was just a mix-up in the work orders at the office, but I had no way of knowing this. The closest telephone was over five miles away at Will Thacker's. I got some of the neighbors to stay with the children and getting my brother-in-law to go with me, I went to see if I could locate Willie. To make it worse, the rain was coming down in sheets. It was almost midnight when we got the Thackers up and got a call through to the Lloyd Hotel at Pikeville where I knew my husband stayed when away from home. I asked the night clerk to go check and see if Willie was in his room. When my husband learned who was on the phone, it was his turn to become worried. No one made a phone call at night except in a case of emergency. He did not give me time to explain before he began asking was something wrong. Was I sure the kids were all right? After I assured him the children were okay, his folks were okay, my folks were okay, and yes, as far as I knew, everyone on Caney was all right, I told him I was only worried about him because no one seemed to know where he was. And you got me out of a good warm bed just for that? He angrily demanded. 
Oh boy, did I hit the ceiling then. I said, you talk about a good warm bed to me. Me and your brother are standing here, drenched to the bone, not a dry thread on our bodies. We waited out of Watts Fort to get here. We have to walk back five miles before we can even think about getting in bed. The next time you get lost, you can go hunt your own self. And with that, I hung up the phone. My friends tell me I live too much in the past. The past does seem so much more beautiful than the present. I don't like the present. I'm afraid of the future, so I must relive the past. I'm not afraid of the future life after death, only the few more years I have to live here on earth. If I could only recapture the past and share it with my children as I remember it, but I am handicapped by the lack of an education. I can write of the events, but how can I make them see it as it really was? How can anyone make another hear the nice musical sounds of the realistic, common, everyday things, like the crackling of a wood fire, the spattering of rain on a board roof, the sharp clanging of a dinner bell, or the soft tinkling of a cowbell? Did you ever awake in the morning to the challenging crow of a rooster? as one crows to be answered by another and then another, on and on until it fades away in the distance, only to be begun over and over again. You can describe the beauty of the autumn trees, but how can you capture the sound of the rustling leaves and the pattering of scurrying little feet that tell you winter is coming? Then you learn the different sounds a mother hen makes as she talks to her small chicks, there's the squawk squawk when she is warning them of danger, the cluck cluck clucks as she maneuvers them from one place to another, then the soft coo 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 as they settle under her wings at night. She is telling them, you are safe, I love you, God is watching over us. If you have heard and loved these sounds as I have, then you know what I mean. Much different from the screaking of car brakes, the grinding bulldozer, or blast of a jet. The most pleasant sound is the yell of a small boy when he comes home from school, slamming the door with a, Hey, Mom, where's supper? I'm starving tea totally to death. I wanted so to be able to write, but was handicapped by the lack of an education. It must not have been so ordered. Over and over again, I have tried only to be stopped. I am not complaining, only explaining. The first time I quit school was when my sister's family was in a car accident and needed me. The next time was in the early 30s. People were being given jobs on WPA, a work program set up and sponsored by the government to help poor people. My father and stepmother were much too old to work, so I received the work order. My father cried when I had to quit school again. I tried to not let him know how much it bothered me. There was just no other way, but I planned on going back later. I was allotted a job with a sewing project located at Heinemann with 20 or 30 other women. All the others were much older, mothers whose husbands were dead or disabled. I always loved to sew, and I had been making my own clothes for years. I would also sew for my friends and neighbors. I was paid 15 cents a dress. Don't laugh. With the price received for three dresses, I could pay for enough clothes to make one for myself. Also, being able to sew came in very handy when I made clothes for my children, often from the best parts of the worn-out pants of grown-ups. If anyone tells you that people working on WPA had it easy, don't believe them. How would you like to walk eight miles, sometimes through snow, work all day using a pedal-type sewing machine, and then walk home that night five days a week. Again, I'm not complaining, only explaining. I've repeated to my children so many times when they would want to use the car for a short drive to the store or post office, I've walked eight miles, worked all day, and walked back. That when I began, they would say, yes, we know, and then sing-song it back to me. In a way, I liked my job on the WPA. I did not like the physical examination by the doctor required by the government. No mountain woman at that time would accept her privacy being violated this way. 
The clothes we made were distributed to the folks who were in need of them. I hated to work with the ugly, sleazy cloth used and the most awful colors, something that would not show dirt. The patterns were large, unshaped, sloppy, made so as to be worn by any size person in a certain age group. I wonder why, when something is given to the poor, it's always supposed to be only useful, never pretty. The poor need beauty more than anyone. When you give something to the unfortunate people, don't only give them something you no longer need and want to get rid of. Give them your best, then God will bless you for it. Believe me, I've been on both ends of the stick, and I know. Even when I got married, I did not give up my ideal of finishing school. Then you very seldom heard of anyone going to school after getting married. Mrs. Maddie Pridemore was the only one that I know who did. In 1939, when my oldest son, Milburn, was past three, I began to plan on an education for myself. My father, who lived next door to us, would babysit. It would mean a two-mile walk and a lot of work. I went to Mrs. Lloyd and asked her if I could return to school, not staying at the community center, of course. She said if I passed the college entrance test, I could enter college without finishing high school. I made pretty good on the exams. I bought some white material to make my uniforms, but instead I used it for baby clothes and diapers, for by the last of March I knew I was pregnant again. My new baby meant more to me than an education. I think a baby should be with its own mother for its first years. Before Orban was two, Lossus was born. When Lossus was just past two, Willie Vernon made his arrival, so I just put all thoughts of school for myself out of my mind. You would think after so many times I would have given up, but not so. Willie Vernon was four. By then, Willie was making enough money that I could hire someone to help with the housework. My father was gone by then. I began to plan on school again for the next year. I had gone to dig a mess of potatoes for supper. I had almost enough, and I stooped over to pick them up. A pain hit me in under my ribs on my left side, so sharp I thought at first I had jabbed myself with the hoe handle. I don't know how long I lay there in the garden, but I soon made my way to the house and to bed where the children found me when they come home from school. I remember being so glad that Vernon was taking a nap. It was 18 months later before I even went outside the house. Doc Duke and Doc Kelly came to see me. One gave me something to make my heart beat faster. One gave me a pill to slow my heartbeat. One said for me to have complete bed rest. The other said I should be made to get up. They both agreed I'd had a nervous breakdown. It was 25 years later before I knew for sure what had happened. I was in the Whitesburg Hospital for a hernia operation. Dr. Pigman ordered x-rays and cardiograms. Only then did I know for sure I'd had a severe heart attack. It left me so weak that it was years before I could go upstairs or climb a hill without resting every few steps. Again, not complaining, only explaining. I learned a wonderful lesson in patience. I made a lot of quilts. I read many, many books. I had a lot of time to think and understand the love of God. I think lots of times when we become too engrossed with our own selves, He makes us stop and begin to realize what life is really about. Different people came to keep house for us while I was sick. Ova Jacobs and his wife, Ines, Vernon, and Elisa, Willie's Aunt Laura. But I owe more to my sister Frances for helping me recover than anyone. I had been sick for so long that I just gave up altogether. She would come and take Willie Vernon home with her. She would bring her family's wash and do it with mine, just as to be with me more. Sometimes she would beg me to try and walk. Again, she would scold or shame me. She never gave up trying. I had just lost all desire to want to try and help myself. If it had not been for her help and love and encouragement, I would never have made it. When she finally got me to stirring around the place, she wanted me to go home and spend the night with her. I was so nervous. I thought I would surely die if I even tried to walk that far, but she never stopped until at last I gave in. I refused to be left alone by myself. Next morning when the kids, except Vernon, had left for school, I wanted to return home. 
I did not know what to think when she said she would not go with me. Surely she did not think I could go by myself. I begged and begged her to not make me go by myself, but to no avail. I carried a cushion with me, and every few steps I would stop to rest. It seemed like hours and hours to make that less than a half-mile journey. Oh, how good my own home looked. When I finally got inside and sat down, I began to cry. I was so hurt because Francis had not come with me to help me. Suddenly, I heard the gate open, and looking out, I saw my dear sister entering. Then I understood she had made me come alone to prove to myself that I could do it. She had been right behind me, out of sight, all the way. Mrs. Lloyd was not the only one who fought against having roads built on Caney. There were some of our own folks who were not willing to give up some of their land for a road. My children, along with others, had to walk to school, sometimes through the creek, sometimes on a narrow path along the hillside. My oldest son many times took off his shoes and waded across, carrying the younger boys one at a time on his back. In 1950, Creeps Reynolds sold us his little farm close to the college and we moved. I did not like leaving my home, but the children did need to be closer to school. In 1953, I again began planning on finishing school. This time, I got farther along, and I even attended school four or five months. Yes, you guessed it, another baby. I hope, by the way, I tell this, I am not given the impression I was not happy with the children God sent me. Far from it. There is nothing except Jesus that I love more than my children. When I was three months pregnant with this baby, I almost lost him. The doctor said I would have to have an abortion because my body was still too weak from the heart attack I'd had a few years before. I would not agree to that at all. I made Willie promise me that if I did get in so much pain that I might agree that he would not. I know the prayers of my friends had more to do with saving my baby than the doctor's. I had to lay in bed for the last seven months before he was born. I had so much trouble. I was afraid the baby might not be healthy, but not so. He weighed in at nine pounds and three ounces. So I never got to finish school, but I still dreamed of writing. In 1974, with the encouragement of Laurel Anderson, I tried to scribble a history of my father's life. I only meant to make a few copies for my grandchildren, but I never dreamed so many people would read it. I take no credit for myself. My father was just such a wonderful person to know him was to love him. I only wrote what I remembered about him so others who did not know him could love him. I have received many letters from people from many states telling me what they thought of the book, Kit and I Sloan. The two I treasure most, a woman from New York said, I wish I had known your father. A boy who was once our next door neighbor came from his home in Indiana to get one. And I said to him, I guess you want it because it has a picture of your mother and grandparents. And he answered, no, I want it for my little girl, Candy, to know all about Kit and I. He was so good to me when I was small. So if I did not get an education, God did let me write, at least so people enjoy what I have to say. I've had a lot of folks to ask me, what do you know and think about coal mining in Eastern Kentucky? And I have to truthfully answer, very little. I've read a lot of good books on this subject, some I like, some I disagree with and hate. Again, I will only have my memory to rely on. Three of my sisters each lost a son in the coal mines. My father nor my husband ever worked in one. True, my father dug coal from a small coal bank on his own farm for his own use. My oldest son had a job with a coal company for a few months when he was first married between his school terms as a teacher. I don't think I drew a long breath what time he was under the hill. Once I almost fainted when I came up on his work clothes when I opened the closet door. Just the thought of poor men having to work where their clothes get that grimy. And that's just the least thing. I sure feel for mothers and wives whose loved ones spend so many hours under the ground like animals. At least they get good wages thanks to the union but they are like the soldiers getting paid more for risking their lives than for the work they do. There is also the other side. Many men now live in fine homes, have nice new cars, their children in college, 
because of their work with the coal industry, some that have no other way to make a living and might otherwise be welfare cases. I remember on my ninth birthday in 1923, my father took me with him to visit my uncle who lived in the Porter mining camps. Everything was so new and different from our home on the farm. All those little houses painted a sickening yellow color. I felt so sorry for those folks having to live in the same kind of house as other folks. Even then I wanted what was mine to be mine only and to heck with going along with the crowd. How I hated those rows and rows of houses and the thought of living in the same building with another family, not knowing or caring who your neighbors were. Even the little outhouses were built together, only a wooden partition separating one from the other. My cousin thought it a great joke when I kept going into the wrong house until I memorized the number on the door. The only thing I enjoyed about my visit, except meeting my kinfolk, of course, was going to the commissary, a large store owned and run by the coal company. This was the largest store I had ever seen, shelves and shelves of canned foods, many I had never heard of before, beautiful clothes, mining tools, even furniture. I could have spent hours and hours just looking. My father said the prices were much higher, the same things could be bought elsewhere for half the money, but the miners were kind of forced to trade there. When a miner got a job and moved into one of the company houses, the first month's rent was charged against his first paycheck. There was also a certain amount went to the insurance for a company doctor, the electric bill, and gas bill. All in all, the miner began working already in debt to the company for sometimes over his first payday. He could also draw script against his future wages. Script, sometimes small tin disc, was used at the company store in place of money and was issued by the company. Thus the miner, already in debt, must trade at the company store for his food at higher prices. Furniture for his home could also be bought this way. No wonder the poor miner sang of, I owe my soul to the company store. By keeping the miner in debt, head over heels, the company was assured of his not quitting his job. A lot has been written about the union and how it was formed. I don't know too much about that. One of my brothers-in-law had a very active part, and my sister was one of the women to carry banners and join the picket lines. The union of the gas employees did not have as much trouble as the coal miners. My husband was one of the first union members of his local 3510. I am a very firm believer in all unions and would back them up with my life. I believe they are the best thing that ever happened for poor, hard-working men and women. I would be afraid to express my real feelings on strip mining as many of my nephews make their living this way. My heart aches at the sight of a black slug of muck that used to be a clear, sparkling brook. Our beautiful mountain tops changed into scarred, tattered hills. So many people prefer greenbacks to green leaves. Our lands were just beginning to recover from the slaughter our grandfathers gave it by repeatedly cutting and destroying the woods to farm our hillsides. They had no other choice, but these strip miners have a lot to answer for. I don't think God would have made our country so beautiful if he had not wanted it to have remained that way. It's not so bad for the ones who have no other way to live, but what about the ones that are destroying something only God can create just to enlarge their bank account? I want to say money is made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. The black lung benefits is a great thing, but it came too late for many who needed it. It's just better late than never. Many of my friends who receive this help have larger incomes now than their paychecks were when they were working to support a large family. They have no breath to enjoy it and could hardly talk with their friends. It's a very wonderful law, but constructed very unfairly. Many who deserve its help do not receive it. I know a lot of men who are drawing black lung benefits that never were minors. Don't ask me how they do it. I just know they do. Okay, we'll stop right there. Kind of a depressing place to start. Uh, Verna May talking about the coal mines. It's interesting because I, I talk about Appalachia so much. Like Verna May, people often ask me what I think about coal mining. And I have to say, I, I really don't know. I have no experience. I don't even have the experiences that Verna May did by way of her, her nephews and her 
uh, brother-in-laws and the people, I think one of her sons, she said, worked there, and, and then what she's seen with her own eyes, because there are no coal mines in Western North Carolina where I live. So I just don't know. I, I don't feel like I can, I can say either way. Like Verna May, I hate the... Um, environmental part of it you know uh, again I've never seen that with my own eyes I've just uh, seen of course maybe videos read books heard songs about it you know John Prine's wonderful song always comes to mind but I don't know I on the flip side of that I can kind of understand what Verna May was saying those people that had were able to put their kids through college and have nice houses and nice cars they likely couldn't have done that if there wasn't the coal mine so I know there's two sides to it I just don't know anything about either side so it was interesting though to hear uh, Verna May kind of what she thought about it and uh, lots have changed even then since then so since Verna May wrote that book so a uh, really fascinating subject that is a huge part of Appalachia when you talk about Appalachia a lot of people that whole culture of the coal mines it's just not one that I'm I'm familiar with uh, or ever had anything to do with since again, there's no coal mines in Western North Carolina. I really enjoyed this, uh, the first part though, when, it, when she first started talking um, in this part about the escapades of her and her sons while Willie was off at work, working at night and working on the weekends and um, working hard for his family. They got into some real, real scrapes. You'd, I would love to have been there seeing them try to fight the pig back into the pen. And then also Verna May thinking that someone was in the chicken house, but it was actually a cow. I can see why that continued to be, com continued to be told in their family and her kids laughing at her. It, interesting part in that too was what she had to go through in those days to go to the grocery store, how she couldn't take all those kids with her, so she would take them all those miles to her sister's house, then go to the store, take all the stuff back home, and then go back to the sister's house and get them. Amazing, all that walking in those days and makes it what we do today seem so easy. Even when, you know, when Corey and Katie was little, because there was two of them and they were the same size, you know, both not able to walk or both just barely toddling around. I had a hard time getting groceries, but I had Granny. I could leave them with Granny, and then I could go get groceries. And then we, someone told me that at Bilo, Bilo's not even in Murphy anymore, but they had a buggy that had a, a little place for kids to sit that buckled them in. Because my problem was I only went to get groceries maybe uh, once a week, once two, every two weeks. So if I put Corey and Katie in the buggy, there was no room for anything else. Anyway, once I found out about that little cart Bilo's had one cart like that I would go to Bilo's and I would use that cart and I would strap them it was kind of they were right behind like where you push and that way they were out of the groceries but they couldn't get away from me and I thought that was a pain but oh my goodness so much easier than what Verna May what she had to go through in those days Another interesting part shows the differences from then to today when we all carry around a, a cell phone with us, we're in constant contact with everybody else, is that she had she didn't have any phone, she didn't have no way of checking on Willie, and she had to walk all those miles, her and her, her brother-in-law in the rain, to, to find out that he was really safe in bed, asleep, and it was just a mix-up. So that, again, just shows the drastic difference. Um, so many different little aspects, drastic difference from today. Not having the phone, of course, is probably the main one you focus on. But then again, that walk and that they had to walk everywhere they went. So if she walked five miles to go use the phone, then she had to walk five miles back. You think about that, 10 miles in the rain too. And they just, she just did it because that's just, that's all you could do. There was no other choice. So that's a really uh, fascinating part too. Also, um, probably my favorite part, though, of this part of the book is that when she's talking about those wonderful little sounds that make up your lives, I've thought about those sounds before like that uh, lots of times. I like, I like those. I like the kind of the theme of Verna May sharing in each, each chapter pretty much we've read is how she focuses on the little things of life. It's the least things that make your life enriches it and makes up the whole of your life. A lot of times not the important things so those listening for those little sounds kind of kind of goes with it a lot of you can hear the sounds of my house in this video you've probably already heard a lot of hammering that's Katie in the basement but I don't know she just hammered that that I love that I love being able to hear that she's being productive and working down there um, I love how if you're I know you're like me and your family if you 
Um, you can tell who's walking by the sound of their footsteps. I really love that. I can tell if I'm laying in the bed or something, I hear somebody at night, I can tell by the footsteps if it's Corey or when she was here, I can still hear her footsteps uh, uh, in my mind, or Katie, or if I'm, you know, maybe I'm taking a nap and I know Matt's not in there with me, I can tell who's coming up and down the hallway. I can tell who's going up and down the steps, whether it's the front steps or the basement steps. The wonderful you know, sound of the wood stove creaking shut and open. Uh, there's so many things like that. Of course, the birds uh, for here, the whippoorwills in the spring, usually is when we'd hear them. And then the katydids in the summer, all those wonderful, wonderful sounds. Uh, so I really liked that part. That was probably my favorite part of this that we read today. And then Verna May having a heart attack. That's, that's fascinating. And, you know, interesting that they diagnosed her to begin with both doctors even though they had two totally different things they were telling her to do they both diagnosed her with a nervous breakdown and then she found out years later no your heart has damage uh, from a heart attack or well, just reading of course we don't know verna may but just reading all this she don't really sound like the kind of person that would have had a nervous breakdown like she's not talked about her anxiety or anything like that so i bet it really was just a massive heart attack um, that luckily, thankfully, didn't kill her. And then it just took that long for her body to strengthen itself back. And then because she did have it and didn't have any answers, that in turn did make her nervous to the point that she was, a, you know, afraid to, to go out by herself or afraid to get up. Um, and also kind of made her depressed because uh, we've just been talking about how she walked and done all this stuff and took care of the farm without Willie and took care of her kids. So she was definitely a go-getter. So then to be inside, you know, laying down and most of the time for 18 months, I can't imagine what a toll that would take on your, just your mental state, uh, how depressed she must have been. So that part's really interesting. Reminded me of a story, Pap's family, unfortunately, very strong, uh, inherited kind of heart disease. Four siblings, I'm counting Pap, four children, all four ended up having to have open heart surgery. Now. You can say, well, it was how they ate, it was this or it was that, but they, they really didn't, any of them fit those, what you would think of as heart disease, but it was just inherited. Their mother died from a heart attack. Lots of aunt and uncles on, uh, in their family had open heart surgery, had the same things. So really, really strong there. But my Papa Wade, he, he didn't suffer from heart stuff that I knew of. I never heard anybody talking about it. Uh, it was Mama Marie that died from the heart attack, but Pap told me one time, said, uh, Pap always did have some heart trouble way back there, and it really put him down for a long time. But he, he kind of got over it somehow. He just, it took a long time, you know, for him, but he finally got over it, and then he didn't ever have no more heart trouble anymore. So I, Verna May reminds me of that, and I wonder if Pap always maybe had a heart attack, but didn't, wasn't diagnosed, and, and then was kind of real sickly for a while, and then kind of got his strength back. That's what it reminded me of, makes me think of that. In those days, so many different things that they, people suffered from that, you know, with um, certainly not medical technology like we have today that there was no way of knowing of. So I found that really interesting and how wonderful that she did recover from it, you know, and then and then go on. But uh, And really sweet about her sister kind of tricking her into saying, no, I can't, sorry, I can't go home with you, you know, and you got to do it yourself. But then following her all the way to make sure that about gets me, about makes me teary. I just thinking about the love and the, and the sweetness there uh, in that little little memory that Verna May shared. Very sweet and, and just wonderful. Families are wonderful for sure when you're in need like Verna May was. So I hope you'll leave a comment and share what you liked most about this part of the book. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday because we've got to find out what happens next.